introduce Professor Pamela Nadell, who I think does not need much of an introduction in this place. Uh, most of you here know Professor Nadell as both an outstanding scholar and an outstanding teacher. And I guess that's the reason why she got the highest award of American University Scholar Teacher Award. Professor Nadell has been a faculty member at AU for a long time, over three decades. Uh, she holds the Patrick Clendenin Chair in Women's and Gender History. And she's been chair of the history department and president of the association Jewish Studies, which is a nationwide association. Um, and she also was the recipient of the American uh, Jewish Historical Society's Lee Max Friedman Award for Distinguished Service. In addition, she's well known for her consulting work for museums, um, which includes the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia and the Library of Congress. And her books include Women Who Would Be Rabbis, A History of Women's Ordination, which was a finalist for National Jewish Book Award. Let me just add, on a personal level, how much I appreciate being a colleague and friend of Pam. And I want to give a big welcome not only to her tonight, but also to her husband, Ed Farber, who is probably still in Nat's heaven. Um, both really have been instrumental in welcoming my wife and me over six years ago now here to Washington and making our transition smooth and easy and I really want to express my gratitude to both Pam and Ed for all they've done for us over the years. And just a few words because you'll hear much more from her and uh, from our discussion, um, just a few words about Pamela Dell's new book which is a groundbreaking history uh, and in fact the first all-encompassing history of American Jewish women. In a masterfully written account, Pamela Nadell traces the history of many generations of women from all over the United States over two and a half centuries. We learn about, for example, the poet Emma Lazarus, whose lines are engraved in the Statue of Liberty, and about the journalist Rosa Sonnenschein, who founded the American Jewess, which was not the first journal for American Jewish women, but unlike its predecessor in German, Die Deborah, uh, not just intended for priestesses in their home. We learn about the Zionist activist Henrietta Sold uh, and about our contemporary Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We read about immigrants from Germany, Hungary, and Russia, about housewives and union organizers, about rabbitsons and women rabbis, about the long-time limitations and the chances that open for modern women, Jewish and non-Jewish, in more recent days. It is a book that received much praise, not just by colleagues and students maybe, but also in the press, for example, the New York Times, the Times of Israel, and the Jerusalem Post. And um, it is a book which, by the way, you can purchase here if you don't have it yet, and have it signed by the author after um, our event tonight. So I'm especially excited um, when I asked uh, Pamela Dell about the format of today's evening and she suggested that she would like to be in a conversation with our students. And I think this is a wonderful idea. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Professor Pamela Nadell and later in conversation our AU seniors, Hannah Gelfin, Jamie Gottlieb and Rose Haas. Good evening, and, and thank you, Michael, again, for such a warm introduction. I, I really, really appreciate it. Um, I think I've, I've been at AU for a super long time, um, and I've done a lot of things that I, I, I like to think of are have been successful, but honestly, one of the best things I ever did was hiring Michael. <laughs> so and I'm seeing a lot of nods. Um, I, 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 I was able to write this book because of American University. I, I got an appointment that allowed me to have 
the space and the time to think. And I also like to think, especially for my colleagues from the history department, that writing this book proves that there's life after being a department chair, <laughs> that you can, you can um, continue your scholarship. So I'm gonna do something that's a little different than what you might think would normally happen in an academic talk. I'm gonna show you some family photos. This is my great-grandmother. Um, for those of you who've been in my house, a couple of people here have, hangs on the wall of my dining room. And if you, it's a little hard to see with the lighting, but if you look at her hairline, you can see that she's wearing a wig, the kind of wig that married Jewish women wore. It's called, oh, thank you, that's great. Um, but don't fall asleep in the front. Um, the wig that married Jewish women, observant married Jewish women would wear, it's called a scheidel, and she's super old fashioned. And I, I wrote in the book that she was super old fashioned, and then I gave a book talk where one of my former AU students um, at a university, where one of my former AU students is getting a PhD in apparel design, and she told me that the style of that dress went out in 1870. But I know that the photo was taken in the first decade of the 20th century. The reason I know that is because it was taken at the same time as this one, and that's her daughter, my grandmother. And she is wearing uh, what's called a lingerie dress or a linen dress, and I like to think of her as very she-she. So if you look at her, she's got a bow in her hair, she's got bows on her shoes, and, um, and, I, and this dress was only in style for seven years, between 1903 and to 1910. So I know exactly when this had to have been taken. Um, and then if I go further in the family photos, I'm gonna show you this one. The woman with her back to us is my mother and she's wearing a white blouse and a black pencil skirt. And if you look, especially those of you in the front, you see the, uh, the baby's bonnet peeking over her shoulder? That's me. And so I know when this was taken on a warm spring day in the early 1950s. And then I didn't bring a photo of me because you can see me. And also because I'm wearing what I always wear, which is a black jacket. Um, but I did bring a photo of my daughter. And she's wearing um, a short skirt and tall boots and looking very appropriate for a college student or graduate student as she was at the time it was being taken. And one of the things that, that um, she said I had to say is that when, when I said, can I please use this photo in my talk, she said, sure you can, but you have to tell them the boots are yours. <laughs> and of course, I didn't remember that. But the point is, like, why do I open a talk about America's Jewish women with the women in my family? And why do I open it by talking about their clothing? But it's their clothing and how their clothing changed over the generations that really drew me into my story. So I knew that their clothing changed, but then how had their lives changed? How had the families that they raised changed? What was different about um, their patterns of bearing children? What was different about what they were cooking in their kitchens? What was different about the homes that they were living in? What was I wanted to know what was different about the games they played? When did Mahjong become a Jewish woman's game? And I can tell you that it was the 1920s. Um, I want to know what was different about their politics. I wanted to understand them across the breadth of America, um, whether they were living in colonial seaports, frontier towns, or urban ghettos, or in, in modern exurbia. I wanted to get a sense of how their lives had changed so dramatically over the 350 plus years that J Jewish women have lived in these United States and their predecessor colonial America. But most of all, I wanted to know what it meant to them to be Jewish women. Because the women in my family were Jewish, and because I'm aware that being Jewish is very difficult to describe and to understand. So I like to think of the women that I talk about as existing on kind of three different trajectories. There's one group of Jewish women for whom being Jewish was at the center of their lives, Judaism with its Sabbaths, with its holidays, with its celebrations, governed them across the decades of their lives. And they put Judaism at their center, and because they did, 
It also dictated what they cooked in their kitchens, who they were in conversation with, um, what organizations they joined. There's a whole nother category of Jewish women that I write about for whom Jewishness is at the center of their lives, or is, is part of their lives. I won't say it's at the center, but it, it affected them deeply. Because they were Jews, it determined who they could marry. It fixed where they would live. It fixed the kind of work they did, or the kind of work they were prohibited from doing. It fixed their politics, the kind that, that they joined in certain kinds of political forces. There's a third category for whom being a Jew was either utterly incidental, hardly ever cropped up, or didn't crop, didn't matter at all to them, but sometimes they discovered it mattered to others. And I like to think of it as sort of this. If you think you can be a little bit Jewish, you think you can be a little bit pregnant. So two women take me into my story. The first is Grace Nathan. Now, the students can't say anything, and my husband can't say anything, but anybody else, have you ever heard of her? No? Okay. So Grace Nathan, take a look at her dates, 1752 to 1831. Clearly, she was well enough off to have a portrait painted. And what we know about Grace Nathan is because of the letters she left behind, we know of her life as a daughter and a sister and a wife and a mother, and a grandmother, and a widow. But when I look at the years she lived in, what do I see? I see she lived through the American Revolution, she lived through the Declaration of Independence, she lived through the um, Constitution, she lived through the War of 1812. What does she talk about in her letters? She writes one letter to a niece and she says, I'm really worried about this relative of ours because she has been spitting up blood for several weeks. But the doctors are convinced it's because her corsets are too tight. Clothing matters. Now this woman, anybody recognize her? Emma Lazarus. Emma Lazarus was Grace Nathan's great granddaughter. And so we have two women who were extensive writers. Um, Nathan left letters, they're unpublished. Lazarus, of course, left a body of poetry. You heard from Professor Brenner's comment before that um, she, it's her poem that's in the base of the Statue of Liberty that has welcomed the huddled masses yearning to breathe free to America for more than a century. But they were two very different women despite being related. Nathan was a wife and mother. Lazarus never married never had any children. But they shared three things in common. They were Americans, they were women, and they were Jews. And as Americans, they both reveled in the freedoms of America. As women, they were both constrained by the roles that society assigned to women of their social class. And as Jews, they both inherited a powerful tradition but as American Jewish women, they set out to change that tradition. And they become my kind of exemplars of the Jewish women I write about who did that. So I want to explain what they did. Emma Lazarus, in one of her poems, wrote that America had given her people the freedom to follow Moses' law. And then she said, and to think the thoughts Spinoza taught. For those of you, yeah, so Eileen knows. So for those of you who aren't familiar with um, Benedict Spinoza, he was a 17th century Jewish philosopher in Amsterdam who was excommunicated by the Jewish community. He was kicked out of the Jewish community for his ideas about biblical criticism that were seen as heretical. She's a maverick. She's claiming Spinoza for her people. The interesting thing is that Grace Nathan, who has a much more traditional life, does the same thing. Grace Nathan, at the end of her life, wrote a document where she said to her son, at my death, only keep your beard for seven days. Under Jewish law, a man will not shave for a minimum of 30 days following the death of a parent. Many Jewish men do not shave for even longer. She was telling her son, I want you to follow my Jewish law. And so we have two women who 
began changing Judaism, which becomes a major theme that I talk about. But they're also exemplars of my two kinds of women. Emma Lazarus was famous. She's, fa she's been in the news so much today during the immigration crisis that I think people think she's still alive. And so there are certain women who would have to be in a book like this because they're the names that you would expect to hear. But I also always wanted to talk about the women who left their mark in a kind of smaller canvas on the, on the canvas of their families and their neighborhoods and the, mem and the memories of those. So I'm going to leave behind the colonial and early republic world of Grace Nathan and most of the time of Emma Lazarus. And I'm going to jump to this woman, Rosa Sonnenshine, who Professor Brenner also mentioned. Rosa Sonnenshine came from Central Europe to the United States in the 1860s. She settled with her husband, who was a rabbi, in St. Louis. And there she did what a good Jewish wife and mother should do. She gave birth to the fourth of her four children. She did things in the synagogue where her rabbi husband worked. And she also, astonishingly, founded the first Jewish women's book club in America. And it is still meeting today. They're called the Pioneers, and it's amazing that something from 1879 to today would still be meeting. But she was also a maverick in a different kind of way, because in 1892, she walked out on her husband. And these were the days when you needed grounds to get divorced, and because of that, he, he divorced her, and she had to find a way to earn a living. So as we heard from Professor Brenner, she created the first English language Jewish women's magazine in the United States. It was published for a brief period of time in the second half of the 1890s. And she called it the American Jewess because the term Jewess is the term that women used, Jewish women and Jewish men and Gentile women and men used to refer to Jewish women. In the American Jewess, she shows us how change is underway. So one of the things that she writes about is she writes about an organization that had just emerged called the National Council of Jewish Women. The National Council of Jewish Women was founded in 1893, and it's the first of a group of organizations that I refer to as the powerhouse organizations of American Jewish life. It was founded by this woman, Hannah Solomon, who's very careful always to describe herself as a good wife and mother, shuttling between her desk and the kitchen to cook on Fridays. Believe me, she wasn't cooking in her kitchen. She had servants. But the National Council of Jewish Women, this is long before women have the right to vote. They enter into politics. And what do they take up? They take up um, fighting against the cause of white slavery. Does anybody know what white slavery was? Are you familiar with that term? I see some nods. White slavery is, is a, the term that was used at the turn of the 20th century to refer to international rings of, um, that engaged in prostitution, especially in, in, term, in Jewish terms of um, enticing young women traveling on their own to America and um, enticing them into what proved to be illegal marriages and then dispatching them to brothels in Buenos Aires and Istanbul. And it was a terrible problem. It was also a problem that helped to spark anti-Semitism because some of the purveyors were known as, as Jewish gangs. And so they were both fighting against white slavery, trying to protect women traveling on their own to America, and at the same time, they were also standing up to fight against anti-Semitism. The second of the powerhouse organizations to emerge was in 1912, and it was Hadassah, the Women's Zionist Organization of America. And what's stunning about this is that this is from 1913, when Hadassah sent two nurses to Jerusalem and that committed the women of Hadassah in America to health care, providing health care for the Jewish community in Palestine. And they saw 5,000 patients in their first year. 
But why were these powerhouse organizations emerging at this time? That's what's really striking. These organizations, they still exist today, over 100 years later. But what's going on at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, again, before women have the right to vote, what's going on that enables them to create these organizations? And here, I think, you have to turn to American history, what we know about American women's lives. In 1800, the average white American woman had seven children. By 1900, she is 3.5. Now, I don't know what to do with the 0.5s. I can't figure it out. But in 1850, the average lifespan of a white woman in America was under 40 years. By 1920, it had increased to 57 years. Women were living longer. They were absorbed with childbearing and child care for far fewer years. And the women of these organizations are middle class women. They were not going to be out in the workforce. And they were looking for ways to give back to their communities and to leave the world behind them a better place. And so this is really the moment when these organizations emerge. But I want to go back to Rosa for a second because one of the striking things about Rosa Sonnenschein was her Zionism. Sonnenschein was, had met Theodore Herzl. I know there are a bunch of students here from the History of Israel class, right? So she had met Theodore Herzl on return visits to Europe. She became enraptured with his idea. And in 1897, when he held the first Zionist Congress, she went to Basel, Switzerland. She was one of about a handful of Americans to attend it. And because no representative of the US press showed up, she declared herself the sole representative of the United States press at the Zionist Congress. And then she came back and wrote about Zionism and championed it in the American Jewess. Women, Jewish women in America did not only need powerhouse organizations to be activists. This is a photo from the, um, around 1910, but it stands for what was the first kosher meat strike in America. In 1902, when the price of kosher beef soared from 12 cents a pound to 18 cents a pound, women who could not feed their families, immigrant women from Eastern Europe who could not stretch those pennies any further, got so mad that they staged the first kosher meat boycott. They broke into butcher shops. They took the meat. They threw it out on the street. They doused it with kerosene so nobody else could eat it. And sometimes they even set it aflame. And they, it was the harbinger of a host of rent and meat strikes sparked by Jewish women in New York and Philadelphia and Boston and Baltimore to, to make certain that they could manage their families on the small amount of money that their husbands were bringing home. Sometimes, however, Jewish women stood up against other forces on their own. And here's my example of Edna Ferber. Um, some of you might be familiar with her, although I imagine most of you aren't. Edna Ferber was um, a Pulitzer Prize winning novelist and she wrote um, Showboat, she wrote Giant, they were both made into movies and into plays. And Ferber describes that in the 1930s, shortly after Adolf Hitler had come to power, she was invited to a soiree in Michigan in the home of some kind of tycoon. And everybody, it was, she said it was in the pine forest. Everybody had to stay over. And at dinner that night, the host started talking about money-grubbing Jews. And she watched as everyone around the table began to agree with the host. And she stood up and said, I am a Jew because they didn't know and she said she had never seen such hatred on the faces of the people around her. And that night, when she went to her room, she not only locked her door, she put a chair under the doorknob in case anybody was going to try to come in and, and attack her. Jewish women standing up against anti-Semitism is something that we see today, and it is something that, that goes way back in American history. But what was going on in the home? Meanwhile, Jewish women in their homes continued to push for change. 
This is one of my favorite books, Kate Simon's Bronx Primitive. Kate Simon was a memoirist, and she describes in this book what happened um, on Fridays in her house when she was growing up. So her mother would polish the furniture with lemon oil, and she would make a filter fish. And then, like a pious Jewish woman, she would cover her hair, and she would light the candles and say the blessing. And then one Shabbat Eve, her mother, in the middle of the prayer, stops, blows out the candles, tears off the head covering, turns to her family and says, no more. I never believed in it, and I don't have to do it to please my mother or anyone else here. According to her daughter, she never lit Sabbath candles again. But the house still smelled of lemon oil and gefilte fish on Friday evenings. So again, an example of Jewish women changing Judaism. Won't make so many rabbis happy, but an example of them changing Judaism. So when I, when I get to after World War II, to kind of jumping ahead, um, something really struck me about the 1940s and the 1950s into the early 1960s. So there are these headlines. Um, Bronx Girl 21 wins Miss America title. Anybody know who? Bess Meyerson, right. Okay. Um, uh, $64,000 um, uh, uh, quiz show champion. Anybody know who that one was? No? Dr. Joyce Brothers. Dr. Joyce Brothers was... So she, her story is great. So Dr. Joyce Brothers was, had, first of all, very unusual. Had gotten a PhD in psychology in the 1950s. Now she wants to stay home and raise her only child, but the problem is her husband's a physician, and he's a resident, and they can't make it on his salary. So either he says to her or she says to him, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to memorize a boxing encyclopedia, which is going to make me look really interesting to these new TV quiz shows, and I'm going to go on. And she went on the $64,000 question and won $128,000 because she won twice. Um, so another, another kind of headline from these years, um, uh, Case of the Teenage Doll, anybody know? Barbie, right, Barbie, okay, Barbie was created by Ruth Handler, Ruth Handler had two children, they were named Barbara and Ken, no surprise. <laughs> Um, this one's not a headline, but it's a song. There was a song that was sung in the late 50s, early 60s called Will You Love Me Tomorrow. It was written by Carol King and Jerry Goffin. What you won't know, however, is on their wedding day, um, first of all, and she was also originally Carol Klein, but what you won't know is that she's pregnant on their wedding day, and that's why they're getting married, because in the 1950s, women who got pregnant out of wedlock essentially had three choices. Try to get an, an illegal and very dangerous abortion or um, or give up the ba have the baby give up the baby for adoption that happened much more to Catholic women than to Jewish women although it happened to some Jewish women or get married um, and then the last example from these years Betty Friedan's the feminine mystique um, uh, so coming kind of at the close of this period of the 1960s 1963 so the reason that there's such different women but they're all Jewish, and they're all, they're all Jewishly identified in very different ways. Um, but they, their names in the news belied this image of women from the 1950s. This is from the National Museum of American Jewish History. I love this photo. Um, I like to think of it as the women uh, who bore the baby boom, pushing the baby boomers into the future. And some of those baby boomers they're pushing would grow up to make a revolution, but also some of their mothers would make a revolution because women pushing baby carriages have a lot of time to think. So the 1960s comes in and there's a major technological change. Um, it's not just the invention of the frozen TV dinners, um, which, which some people who are older will, re will remember coming in, but the big technological change that ushers in the feminist revolution is the invention of the birth control pill, which gives women for the first time ever the opportunity to control, really control their fertility. It, uh, the 60s are a time of tremendous turbulence, but for women, 
This is the image of the 1960s. We think of the feminist revolution underway and women on the march. And what is astonishing is the number of Jewish women in the forefront of American feminism in its leadership. I, even in this book, I couldn't begin to enumerate all of them and the places where they made their contributions. But I want to tell you about two. So I've already pointed out Free Dan. I want to, I want to point to two women who actually um, came from Europe. Um, one was named Sonia Pressman. She was a lawyer. She had left Nazi Germany and be, was as a refugee. And when she was trying to get a job as a lawyer in the 1960s, she was told that um, by one man, he said to her, you can be my legal secretary. Um, instead, she went in 1964-65 to work for something called the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission, which had been established to enforce Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which prohibited discrimination in employment based not only on race, but also on sex. Pressman was a lawyer working there, and she watched as all the men who were working with her were only interested in picking up the cases about racial discrimination in employment. But one third of the cases coming in were about sex discrimination. And so she turned to Fredan and she said to Fredan, we need our own civil rights association, referring we meaning um, American women, and they together they helped found the National Organization for Women. 12% of its founding members were Jewish women at a time when Jews made up about 3% of the population of the United States. Another Jewish woman, this one a refugee from Austria, came to America, got a PhD in history at the, in her 40s, and decided that the history of half of the world had never been written, and she championed in her adopted country to create a Women's History Week. Her name was Gerda Lerner. My historian colleagues know this well. And now we have Women's History Month. The feminist movement deeply affected American Judaism. This is what the Jewish world used to look like. Anybody recognize anyone in that photo? No? <laughs> To the left of the rabbi is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yeah, this is great, a great photo. Um, this is her confirmation, the equivalent of her bat mitzvah in 1946. And because of the work that she did, after all, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has asked, what is the difference between a bookkeeper and a Supreme Court justice? And her answer is one generation. And that same generation ended up bringing major changes to American Judaism so that the world now looks in parts of the Jewish world like this. So we've covered a huge amount in like a very short period of time. Um, we've talked about women for whom Judaism was at the core of their lives like Grace Nathan. We've talked about women for whom Jewishness was more in the center of their lives, like many of the women in the National Council of Jewish Women. We've talked about women for whom Jewishness was really incidental, like um, uh, Edna Ferber, until somebody else made it count for them, made it, made it really count. So I want to close out these remarks with um, one, one final pair of letter writers. In, um, some of you will remember this, some of you won't know about this. In, in the 1980s, when the Soviet Jewish movement was underway in the United States, American Jewish boys and girls at their bar and bat mitzvahs would be twinned with a Jew in the Soviet Union, a child who couldn't have a bar and bat mitzvah. So in 1982, a teenager from North Miami Beach sends to her twin, Kira Volvosky, um, a letter and she says, did you get the stationery that I sent you and the letters that I sent you? So I went looking for Kira Volvosky. I found her thanks to Facebook, interviewed her from Jerusalem where she is now a web designer. And I said, did you ever get the stationery that your twin liked to collect and did you get the letters? And she said she had no idea, she didn't remember her twin's name is Cheryl Sandberg, COO of Facebook. 
And I, I, so you can understand why I didn't go trying to interview Sheryl Sandberg about this. But um, she said, then Kira continued, she said that her father and Cheryl's mother are Facebook friends. And I think it's a great place um, to end this part of the program because it's a way to think about the future. What are historians going to use to write the next chapter in this particular book? So thank you. And I want to thank you. Um, okay. And we're going to, I'm going to invite our um, panelists to come up. And I'm going to introduce them. Yeah, this is on? Okay. Um, so the, the first thing that I want to say before I sit down is I want you to help me thank these amazing students for agreeing to read a book in the middle of the semester that wasn't required for one of their courses. <laughs> um, and I, and I, I really, I'm really very grateful to them because they're just extraordinary. So um, next to me is Jamie Gottlieb. She's a senior from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, majoring in Jewish studies um, with a minor in leadership and management. And she's currently researching for her senior thesis in Jewish studies, eating disorders, sexual abuse, and sexual education in the ultra-Orthodox community for her senior thesis. And last semester, she studied abroad at Hebrew University. And next to her is Hannah Gelband, a senior from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, who's majoring in history with a minor in Jewish studies and one in psychology. She's writing her senior thesis in the history department on the hidden children of France and Belgium and the formation of their Jewish identity. And last summer, she interned at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. And next to her is Rose Haas, who's a senior majoring in Jewish studies who comes from Los Angeles. And um, she has a minor in elementary special education. She teaches at Washington Hebrew Congregation and at the lab school. And she's writing her senior thesis with Lauren Strauss, as is Jamie Gottlieb, um, on Holocaust survivors' children and grandchildren and the transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, which um, seeks to understand the phenomenon of inherited trauma through the external environment and gene alterations. Okay, so an amazing group of AU seniors. And I don't know, where should we start? We should start with you, Rose. You want to start? Uh, you have to... Okay. Okay. Uh, there's... Yeah. Is it on? Did you... Uh, is this on? Tap it. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, Good. Well, first, thank you so much for having us up here to chat. Um, <laughs> In, in your book talk just a few minutes ago, you uh, referenced the American Jewess. Um, in classes that we've taken with you and in, in scholarship that I've read, I am familiar with the term Jewess as a derogatory way to refer to Jewish women, a yeah. slur. Um, when, did that, when did the etymology of the word change and when did it go from acceptable to unacceptable and now socially acceptable. Right, so it seems to, it seems to have come around again. I don't, I don't know what, what people think about it. Um, we, so I, I actually, I had a slide, but you won't be able to see it um, through our heads, I guess. Um, we, there, there's something, so there's something called Google Ngram. You know about Google Ngram, right? Do you want to explain that? Explain yeah, sure. <laughs> so Google Ngram looks at books and words mentioned in books throughout history. So you can type in like a word into Google Ngram and then it will show you like the frequency of the usage of that word over time. So essentially if you typed in Jewess, you could see like the years where it was published the most and then where it kind of drops off and then where it might start to come up or down again. And you're getting, especially for the students, you're getting a sense of how 
our research changes because of these new technologies that are out there. So Google, so with Google Ngram, you can you can chart Jewish, just like Jamie said, and it's very clear that that the word is used pretty extensively in literature, and then after about 1940, it just kind of disappears. And then it never completely goes away. And the really striking thing is there's a new spike, like in this generation. So um, I, we were, the four of us met over the weekend and we were chatting about this. Um, and I, I, I didn't really know that you would all know who Gilda Radner was, but, uh, but they did. So, the, the, so Gilda Radner was this comedian um, on the first cast of Saturday Night Live. And she had this very famous skit called Jewish Jeans, where she's, and, and, it's, and it's very sardonic. And it's not something that a Jewish woman really wanted to be called. But I hear the word a lot. You guys hear the word? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like in what in what context? Where are you hearing it? Use use the yeah yeah pick that up out and then keep it close to you and pass it back and forth. There we go. Social media, people refer to themselves as uh, such and in a in a good sense, a positive word. I've seen it more in the books that I have to read for class or the books the academic works that I see. It's usually used to describe a Jewish woman either derogatorily or not, but most of the time in more recent works I see it as someone a Jewish woman calling herself a Jewish and saying it proudly. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I've seen it in a couple different friends that I have have started blogs or different mm. like new publications and one of them is called the Jewess Diaries, where she details like her modern day like trials and tribulations of being an American Jewish woman. So she kind of writes about like what it means to be an American Jewish woman today and the different things she encounters. Oh, it's so cool. I don't like the word. <laughs> I just, yeah, no, I know. I know. Um, I, I did a, a podcast and um, called Unorthodox, maybe some of you know it, and the hosts on that show have like this argument back and forth about using it, and one of them uses it and one of them doesn't, and sometimes they call their guests Jewesses of the Week, and I told them, do not call me that. I don't like that. <laughs> yeah. All right, what else did you guys want to talk about? about. Who's next? Jamie? Yeah. <laughs> I can go next. Okay. Um, so one of the topics that you use throughout your book is that of a woman's home life and oftentimes like how marriage and children and family life shifts for American Jewish women throughout time. So one of the big topics today that people are talking about in the American Jewish community is that of intermarriage and assimilation. So how, how do you think this really affected American Jewish women throughout history? And what, like, do you think it's the new topic that everyone thinks that it is? Or do you think it's been around for kind of a while? We just haven't been paying as much attention to it. Right. So it's, it's clear that you know, this is one of those places where, like, it, it's so important that people know history under, like, you have some context for the world. So I didn't have a chance to talk. Um, I often do in, in a longer version of my talk. I talk about Abigail Levy Franks, who was this, like, amazing letter writer. And um, she's the great letter writer of colonial Jewry. And, and you, you see how women's history changed because when her letters were first published in the 60s, they were called the letters of the Franks family. But 38 of the 41 letters were written by Abigail. So when they're republished in the 21st century by a woman's historian, they're republished as the letters of Abigail Levy Franks. And so he, she's one of those women who centered Judaism at the core of her life. She was observant. Um, she told her, her son never to eat anything except for bread and butter at his uncle's house because she didn't trust her sister-in-law's kosher kitchen. And, but, but she, and she has these like really radical impulses, but when her daughter Fila intermarries, she's so depressed. I mean, that's her words. I, you, she spelled it a little oddly, but so depressed. That's how she spelled it with a T, that she said she never wanted to speak or talk to anyone again. And we see, what we really see the big change is that over the course of the 19th and early 20th centuries, intermarriage is really gendered. Men are much more likely to marry out. By the time we get to the seven, 1970s, the pattern has shifted, and I think, it's, I think it's stayed that way now. What do you think? What do you, Hannah? 
I mean, my, my family kind of has a say in that. My, my dad married my mother. My mother was Catholic, um, and, but she converted before, she, before I was born. So, but he did marry out, and then she, she did convert. I am currently dating an Irish Catholic boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I think it is a little more common for women to marry out these days. My sister is also dating a, a Christian male. So, um, and I haven't really heard many, many Jewish men marrying out these days, and it's a lot more common for women. That's interesting. I really that would be really fascinating to find out if it's really shifted that much. There's there's a moment in the 19th century where some Jewish newspaper says that it's it's bemoaning Jewish men marrying out, and it actually says not one of our Jewesses would even consider it for a moment. And we where we have statistics in the 19th century, it's very clear that men are marrying out in much greater numbers. Probably in part also because there's a shortage of women in the United States in in the 19th century. I mean, there's there are multiple reasons for it. But you're right, the patterns have changed. And of course, the intermarriage statistics today in the Jewish world outside of the Orthodox are 70% marry out. So it's really a, a big a big moment of change. So I know one of the things that we were talking about was we thought maybe we would talk a little bit about like, like who are the figures that you would want to see in a book if, that would take this story further. So who, who, who would you like to see? Like, Um... I would like to see, well, Natalie Portman, for one, she's an, an actress. That Get a little closer to this. So can hear. Um, <laughs> Natalie Portman, she's an actress that everyone knows, Jewish, Israeli, American, really outstanding in everything she does, and also very uh, prominent in the Jewish community. We have Mayim Bialik, um, star of Big Bang Theory, and also neuroscientist, uh, uh, making waves in her own way. And we also have a uh, representation of Jewish women in the media with The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, if anyone's ever seen that. Yeah. Breaking ways, making people laugh. Um, and then in animation, we have the character from Big Mouth, Jesse Glazer, 13-year-old bat mitzvah feminist, feminist oh. of the future. <laughs> that one I don't know. The problem is I don't know popular culture. <laughs> as, a, as, a reverend, as a reverend of that, as that show is, she really, she really is something. Yeah, very cool. Who would you want to see? Um, I would probably say the next chapter of this book, or the next <laughs> book that you write. Um, I, I would go with uh, female Twitter rabbis who are yeah. um, social activists in their own sense and they're using social media as their platform to um, really make a difference. Um, a few that come to mind, Rabbi Jill Jacobs and Danya Ruttenberg, um, they're, they're becoming like really famous um, and they're using Twitter as their platform uh, to preach, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, and, and they talk about social issues and climate change and anti-Semitism and, and they're, they're making a splash right. on social media. So in that sense, talking about issues, they, they link to these histories of the women who were also social activists. But we're, we historians are going to have to use new tools to reach this. You know, we're going to have to read Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> you know, reading those tweets. <laughs> Can't wait to be doing that. <laughs> who would you um, want to see? I think that I would want to see um, the new female CEOs who are Jewish female CEOs of different Jewish organizations who are taking the Jewish institutional world into a new direction. So oh. Sheila Katz, who is the new CEO of the National Council for Jewish Women, and she was also a vice president at Hillel International mm -hmm. for a long time. And I think that these there are both women in the Jewish organizational institutional world and also in the Jewish religious world who are changing what Jewish institutions look like. And one of them is from a Jewish prayer space called Mishkan in Chicago, um, Rabbi Lizzie Heidman. And I think that women like this are really pushing the bounds of what American Jewish society looks like and where it's going to go in the future. So I think that they're guiding these organizations and institutions like the National Council of Jewish Women that have linked them to their history in this book, but will take them forward into the future. And of course, like when in this book, until we get to the last chapter, there are no women rabbis. I mean, there they just didn't didn't exist. Maybe we should open it up to questions, comments from the audience, and you can ask them too, not just me. Okay. <laughs> oh 
Um, sure. Uh, just, yeah, okay, my name is Theo. I'm a freshman um, in SIS. Um, I was just wondering about the female rabbis thing. I don't know actually, you know, like, who was the first female rabbi and how did that change in the rabbinical system come about in America? Um, the, the yeah. <laughs> I wrote I wrote an earlier book called Women Who Would Be Rabbis, which is a, which is about that subject. Um, th there's there's an argument in American Jewish life that's part of the argument that's going on in American life about whether or not women can enter the professions, and it starts in the late 19th century, but it's not resolved in America until the first woman in the United States becomes a rabbi in 1972, which I know is before you were born and seems like a long time ago, but really 1972 is not that long ago. And it, it's why and, until women become enter into the rabbinate in a significant cohort and really have enough, I, I would say enough women behind them who kind of are supporting them, that the kinds of changes that, that Jamie and Rose have been talking about could could begin to happen. So it's it's really a rel a very recent phenomenon. It's ama yeah, it's amazing. And and that was in and there are different branches of Judaism. And um, so th it was more than a decade after that that women in the second branch of American Judaism got ordained in the conservative movement. And today there are women who are either functioning as rabbis with the title rabbi, more often with a, a feminized version of a different title, um, in the orthodox world as well. And that's very recent. So we're really talking about something that, that's only been happening for a short period of time. Good question. Yeah, and welcome to AU. <laughs> Others? Other questions or comments? Hi, Pam. Me. And panel. Um, what really strikes me is the question, um, how is it that this book did not exist until you wrote it? <laughs> um, it seems so obvious, yet it wasn't there. So can you um, give us a little... Well, my, Michael, your, your husband was a little bit more generous. There was, there, there was one, th there were essentially like two predecessors to this book. Um, one was written in 1976 by the historian actually who wrote about the kosher meat boycott, Paula Hyman, and with two other people. She wrote as a graduate student in a summer and it was seen, and, and, and basically the book is, you know, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know, but these are things we want to know about. And um, there's one sentence in that book that sparked my writing, Women Who Would Be Rabbis. I mean, that, that's what's so striking. Um, but it was, it was a popular book. It, wasn't, it didn't have the academic sourcing behind it. And she was so nervous about that book that when she came up for tenure for the first time, she debated whether or not to even put that book on her resume. Um, and then there was, um, earlier in, in the 21st century, there was one book that a journalist and a historian did together. They don't source it well, and it really wasn't, in my opinion, a very good book. And I also know that it didn't sell well. So um, I, I think the reason that this book has done well and, and why I could do it now is because I, I've been thinking, I'm just going to stand so I can see you in the back. I've been thinking about, about this book for my whole career. I, um, when I say American University supported me, I really mean it. I had multiple sabbaticals where I was working on some version of this book. And I needed two things. I needed the scholarship in American women's history. I needed decades of that scholarship underneath me. And then I needed the scholarship in American Jewish women's history, which only really began to emerge in the 90s. And I will say that the day that I sent off this manuscript, my daughter posted a photo of herself on Facebook at the age of four. She's now 26. She said, my mom finally finished the book. So I, wor I thought about it and worked on it for a long time. And I also, frankly, I was afraid of doing this book. I didn't think I could do it. I just didn't. It, it, this, there are some book projects that we do that we know it's like, you, you can see them. You can see them from the beginning. This is, this is a big book, and I didn't think that I could do it. And I, and I, re I always knew I wanted to make it accessible. Um, I wanted it to speak to my academic colleagues, but I wanted it to speak to the audience. Like Paul and I were having a conversation before about people need to know American Jewish history, right? So I wanted it to speak more widely. Yeah, others. 
She's got the mic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so I, it has been my experience from my contemporaries and um, younger people and my mother's generation and grandmother's generation that Jewish women do tend to be strong-willed, assertive, dominating. Uh, is there any studies or any information on how we became that way or why we're that way? Right, or, or, or why, why, the, why the stereotype, why the stereotype exists. Um, the, yeah, yeah, you guys have any, you wanna say something? You wanna respond? Yes. All right. Um, I, I'm not totally sure. I did look once in a Jews in American popular culture class at how Jewish women are portrayed in different sitcoms and in media. And I think that, and it's often like that, it's often as strong-willed or like loud. And I think that that can contribute to what society thinks about it because that's really what people consume is media and like how they formulate their thoughts about the world around them. So, I mean, I'm not an expert. I'm not totally sure like, why and if they actually are like that. I'm like that, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what do I think? Uh, I, and, and then I'm, I'm gonna give Hannah a chance too. So I, I they're, they're representations, but in, in the book, I argue that Jewish women have a very strong sense of self and that part of the way they translate that sense of self is about being activists, that they really wanted to change the worlds around them. And they do it in different ways, like fighting to become rabbis or through their powerhouse organizations, through philanthropy. And so there, it, it's not that there's necessarily an element of truth in those representations, but that there is, a, of the groups that I wrote about, and I didn't write about everyone, but of the thread that runs through is about that powerful sense of self. And so sometimes that gets translated as being loud or pushy or something like that. Anna? Well, it gets to sem oh. It gets dissem disseminated by, uh, largely by American Jewish comedians, but also, um, Oh, oh, how did, oh, okay. <laughs> you and Jamie, right? <laughs> um, the, right. No, but some, some of it is, I would say that, that, that there's, that there, Jewish women are very empowered in American Jewish, in Jewish culture. Um, they were also breadwinners. So they have a long history of, of, of being breadwinners. They also, it, Judaism is a very gendered religion and it has very strong places for Jewish women. But I can't speak for everybody. Um, and going back to Jamie's point about um, people consuming the media and that message being distributed across the media, um, it's Jewish women who are watching these representations in the media and then absorbing that into themselves saying this is, if this is the Jewish women, woman that is being, dis being told that this is how she has to be, if she has to be assertive, a go-getter, go what she wants, I would like to be like that as well. So then they absorb that and try to represent that in their lives. If that's being the stereotypical Jewish women of the times, then that's not really a bad thing to be necessarily. Yeah, all right, well, let, let's talk afterwards. I'll talk with you afterwards about it. I think I saw another question. Did I see another one? I've seen a couple, here's one. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Kate, I'm a junior at AU. Uh, this might seem like a silly question, but I kind of enjoy the fact that my peers are in front of me right now, <laughs> and I just wanna know that, uh, what woman did you enjoy reading about in this book the most and why? Oh, that's such a good question, thank you. I am a big fan of Rosa Sonnashine. I think that she is funny and also excellent. And I admire her. And I think that like going out of her way to make a publication and employ herself and really sell it and do it. And like also have like had a relationship and had a family and 
decide that she doesn't want it, doesn't like it, and wants to just, like, move on. I really respect her, and I think that she is gutsy, and I like that about her. So I like reading about her and learning about her. Can I, I just have one. Uh, my favorite quote of Rosa Sonnenschein is that she told her grandson, well, um, he said, why did you walk out on Grandpa? And she said, I wanted to get rid of him. I didn't want to ruin him. Yeah, yeah, she's really gutsy. <laughs> so fun. There you go. Thank you. I also enjoy Rosa Sonnenschein, but um, I really liked reading about Emma Lazarus, mostly because she's someone we've learned about in elementary school, their poems and her writing, and just learning about the pers who she was as a person, what an activist she was. She's saying, screw that, I'm not going to get married, I'm going to write. My poems are going to be on the Statue of Liberty, and they're going to be inspiration to anyone who's coming into this country, Jewish or not. And I really think that's such a strong woman who knows what she wants. She's going to go out and write and can ex also express herself in such a way is really, um, really fitting to learn about. And I just, I really like reading about her. Use the other one. <laughs> the court doesn't go that far. I'm going to say this just because there's a certain professor in the back of the room. Um, Clara <laughs> Lemlich comes up <laughs> a lot um, in this book. Um, and uh, not only... <laughs> oh, I got an A! <laughs> um, not, you know, it's exciting to see these names, not only because we, we learn about them in, cl in class here at AU with, with our professors, but um, she's someone who, you know, I, I strive to be kind of like. She's a go-getter, she's an organizer. And Explain to them, I don't think they all know, I didn't talk about her. I didn't talk about Lemlick. Explain, explain who she is. Uh, there goes my A. Um, <laughs> Clara Lemlick was a, a, a labor, or, a union labor organizer, um, and staged major strikes um, to protest the like awful working conditions that sweatshop workers and, and Jewish women, especially, were affected by. Yeah, and she she was always described as a wisp of a girl, but when she galvanizes the 1909 shirt waist makers strike, with 20,000 women walk out, um, and this wisp of a girl was really 23 years old and had her ri multiple ribs broken because she had been galvanizing strikes for years. Yeah, that was a good question. Others? Any others? Over there, we've got one more. Hi, my name is Madison. I'm a junior at AU. Um, my question is, so for a long time, history has been mainly gendered on men specifically. How do you think that the next generation, specifically including your book as well, can try and focus and bring up these women that have not been talked about before because of how um, centered it has always been on men specifically in the early like 1940s and all of that? Right. Um, I, I, I love your question because it, it's, it, it's just indicative of how history was, was written for so long. So my favorite, one of my favorite histor comments by a historian about Grace Nathan, who I showed at the very beginning, he, he puts her in a book and he says the only reason she's in this book, he literally says this, is because her brother was famous and her husband was famous. That's the only reason that they even mention her in the book. And then, of course, I center her so differently. And I think what I, one hopes is that um, as we craft more complicated narratives, of the American experience that this kind of work and the work of so many of my colleagues who are here tonight will enter into those narratives and may, and, and allow for the kind of decentering away from, you know, reading about sort of the, the men who were engaged in politics and in war. That said, um, when I was thinking about writing this book, I, um, uh, somebody in the publishing industry sent me to Politics and Prose and said, I want you to look at whether the book's on the bookshelves in the history section, and I looked in, in the Jewish history section as well. And they're mostly still about men. They're mostly, they're the, bi the biographies of, you know, presidents and, and war. Those are, those are still what people tend to read. So I think one of the things we need to do is we need to diversify what we're reading. It was a really good question. Okay, do we have time for one more? Let's see. Okay. Not so important. Um, 
I'm curious, when we talk about uh, American Jewish women in public political life, we often focus on a particular Supreme Court justice, but there are quite a number of Jewish women in high elected office right. and have been for quite some time. I'm curious where that story begins, American Jewish women in electoral politics, right. um, and also what we know about what might be different of the experiences of Jewish women in elected office as compared to either their Jewish male colleagues or their non-Jewish female colleagues. Right. Oh, that's a great question. Um, first, first of all, like you mentioned, there's a Jewish Supreme Court justice, a female one, but there are two, right? I mean, we tend we tend to forget um, because uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has become, you know, su such an icon for um, so many people. The first Jewish woman in um, in Congress was Florence Prague Kahn. She succeeded her husband. She took over what was usually called the widow's seat. And then she got continued to get elected. But people don't know much about her because she was Republican. And the majority of American Jews became Democratic. And so I, there are two friends of mine right now who are working on a biography of her. But you're right, Jewish women entered into politics and um, into electoral politics. But I would argue that the women of the National Council of Jewish Women were also in politics. They just weren't in electoral politics. And that Jewish women have a long history of that kind of political engagement. And then there are, there are many now who are writing the next chapter. Um, and some of them come out of Jewish women's organizations. I mean, there's, there's one woman in Congress now who had been not out of a women's organization. She'd been synagogue president. And she used that as her platform to say, if I could run a synagogue, I could also run this particular congressional office. So I think maybe we should, we should break, but would you thank my, my wonderful students? Thank you.